on today's episode of the Law of Tech podcast. The core regulatory framework here is increasingly showing a more role, the, an increasing role of the public sector of the European Union and also member states to provide the, the, those constitutional safeguards that are necessary in order to ensure that private actors do not abuse their freedoms, you know, but actually perform their activities and also are engines of democracies, but respecting the constitutional values that are still agreed, debated in democratic circles. Hi and welcome to another episode of the Law of Tech podcast. In this episode, we'll be talking a little bit more about the importance of constitutional law in the digital age. And for this, I'm joined by Giovanni De Gregorio. Giovanni is a postdoctoral researcher working with the Programme in Comparative Media Law and Policy at the Centre for Social and Legal Studies at the University of Oxford in the UK. Uh, his research interests deals with constitutional law, human rights, internet law, privacy and data protection. And more specifically, his doctoral study investigated the rise of European digital constitutionalism as a reaction and strategy against the predominance of digital private normativities. Uh, and this is also a topic we'll be uh, addressing in more depth today. Giovanni, welcome to the uh, welcome to the show. It's lovely having you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here for this episode. Um, now, the development towards digital constitutionalism uh, is a development that has taken place over time, moving from digital liberalism to constitutionalism and passing by what you call in your research judicial activism. Can you maybe, maybe take us through these different phases? Yes. When I, when I talk about a European digital constitutionalism, I try to design a kind of constitutional path that actually uh, the European Union has followed in the last 10 two years, moving from digital liberties precisely to digital constitutionalism. And actually, uh, this this path has started from digital liberalism, and we can use two examples in the field of content and data, uh, using the example of the Commerce Directive, for example, the Data Protection Directive. In both cases, we can see how uh, the European Union has tried to foster <clears throat> fundamental freedoms, like uh, the freedom to provide services and also the free circulation of data. And these have been the two, you know, drivers of the European approach, as we have already said, actually, at the at, between the end of the last century and the beginning of this century. And, and of course, uh, they try to represent a different approach um, to, uh, to the digital challenges uh, that it was impossible to foresee at that time. But then, especially this, the second phase of uh, towards digital constitutionalism uh, that, uh, that, is, that I usually try to call like uh, judicial activism actually was... Um, was triggered by, um, first of all, the, the, the consolidation of the Charter as a Bill of Rights of the European Union in the aftermath of Lisbon, of the Lisbon Treaty. So we are after 2010, more or less 2009, 2010, and also the rise of online platforms as new actors in this field that increasingly start to challenge, you know, and also profits from the neoliberal approaches that was adopted at the beginning of this century. And so, of course, the ICJ has played a critical role in this sense, also to face the kind of legislative inertia, you know, of European lawmakers that started, as we know very well, to discuss the GDPR in 2012. And then, of course, we actually, uh, the GDPR was adopted just, in 2016 and this time the European Court of Justice plays a critical role and this is clear in the field of data if you look at cases like Google Spain, Digital Rights Ireland or the Schrems decision for example the, that, that, the first one in 2015 but it's also clear in the field of uh, of the Commerce Directive, if you look at decisions as Scarlet, for example, or Netlog, where actually the relevance of fundamental rights um, has been clear also in the limitation for member states to impose general filtering obligation to online intermediaries. And so this is a way now in, in which the European Court of Justice has really underlined the relevance of, of fundamental rights and freedoms in the what in the what then has become the digital single market and then of course there is the face of digital constitutionalism that has been a, in a way 
launched by uh, by the digital single market, where actually the union focus on, in a way, uh, codifying the ICJ lessons. You know, in terms of think about the right to be forgotten in the GDPR, the proportionality assessment that we can find in other measures, also in the DSA, in a way. And also the other idea of the digital constitutional strategy of the union was to limit platform power. And this is clear for, for example, in the communication for online platform in 2015, that the way that where actually the commission recognized that platforms are important pieces of the internal market. But since they play an increasing role in that, of course, they also... um, this this role entails wider responsibility. And so this, of course, it's a call for the union to do something in order to limit the power of these actors, you know, not only in terms of the market, so once again, competition law, but also in terms of the democratic side of the union. So this is why constitutional law is relevant in this case. Yeah, exactly. And it's funny that you actually mentioned this topic of uh, the digital uh, internal market or the digital single market, because uh, I always find it kind of confusing when thinking about this topic, uh, because the whole idea behind the digital internal market was to kind of remove the obstacles uh, that were withholding citizens uh, undertakings and governments from really reaping the benefits that technology offers us and also to ensure free movement across the different borders. But by introducing this digital constitutionalism it kind of seems that we're or that the eu is challenging this whole concept of freedom right yeah th- this is a very good question I, I, to be honest i've not seen a kind of challenge you know but a kind of change of approach because I, maybe I, I think i've already said that uh, the, the rise of digital constitutionalism in the, in the european union is not just you know a uh, it's not really replacing the internal market approach, but it's really complementing its goals, you know. And I think also that the GDPR is a good example to see how uh, we have a, a, an important focus on the role of data subjects and fundamental rights, and that is the constitutional part. But also we have, you know, also the role of the GDPR and the freedom also of the data controller, you know, to determine... Uh, um, the, the, the some some kind of safeguards also based on their principle of accountability and this in a way also reflects common mark common market goal and internal market goal that try of course to balance you know the gdpr uh, shows that how the european union is going towards a balance and that's in a way the recent proposal for the artificial intelligence act shows this kind of um let's say, mixed approach between a constitutional framework, if you look at the first recitals that focus on, on human values and European values and the, the, the internal market approach and the regulation of some specific sector like AI. But so uh, to sum up, I think that in this case, uh, the union is not exactly intervening in the market, but it's trying to more injecting kind of constitutional safeguard, which in a very way has been really neglected in the last 20 years. Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's like a balancing test, like you say. But on at the same time, what we see a lot, um, at, at least, uh, for example, in Europe, in Brussels, is that a lot of tech companies uh, send their you know uh, masses of lobbyists to, for example, Brussels, uh, kind of challenging this approach. You could say that the EU is holding this constitutional based approach by trying to you know get some kind of uh, position for themselves in order to make it easier to you know, uh, to move data within the union or any other uh, aspects that they're focusing on. Uh, Would you then say that uh, rather than challenging the uh, concept of the digital internal market, are these tech companies challenging uh, the this constitutional based approach by the EU? What I think uh, in this case is that, of course, these platforms, uh, um, of course, they challenge the constitutional approach in the sense that they provide, of course, standards and uh, or uh, and procedures that, of course, in a way, competes with the standard and procedure provided by you know uh, the new phase of digital constitution, but in a way in which public authority also determines standards of protection. And this is interesting. Also, the case uh, uh, the case of content moderation is a clear example of how platform, for example, set safeguards and then are able to enforce them. And this sometimes escape, uh, you know, the logic of, uh, uh, for example, judicial check of, uh, for example, of the illicity or the legality of certain content. Because of course, platform sometimes take the, take autonomous decision on how to remove content. And this sometimes, of course, in this way, they decide also 
whether content are legal or not. And so this, of course, in a way, challenged the, also in a way the principle of the rule of law also, uh, because uh, there is an increasingly, as I, as I, as I said before, is an increasingly co- there's an increasing competition between uh, the private ordering and public authority. There is an increasing, uh, in a way, rush between uh, imposing standards in the digital environment. This that is not just clear in the face of content moderation, but also in other fa- in other fields where there is really this fight uh, between um, public values and private interests. Yeah, exactly. And we see it uh, at a mass scale. It almost seems like it's impossible for the EU to make a decision without uh, other parties that you know are so powerful uh, to also have a say uh, in what the EU eventually decides. And that's in a way worrisome because it means that it's almost impossible for the EU to actually make an independent decision. There are always you know, other important uh, aspects that have to be taken into account. And uh, that also kind of leads me to this thought that we focus so much on these tech companies and the EU also focus on these tech companies. We have to you know, uh, regulate the way in which they moderate content. But one thing that we may be a little less focused on is how, for example, uh, the EU is obtaining power through also these tech uh, developments and how uh, national governments are doing the same. Uh, I think I read like a little bit in in one of the articles that you wrote on this topic on how we're kind of missing this aspect uh, of the power that public authorities are gaining rather than private authorities, but we, or the EU and in general, we don't seem to be focusing on that, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, there are kind of different concerns because, of course, uh, as you uh, as you know, also technologies have also, uh, are also an instrument for public authorities uh, precisely to exercise powers and also interfere with the fundamental freedoms. But what is in particular important is there is also the interest, you know, of, uh, of public authority to rely on social media to enforce public policies online. And this is why also we... Uh, at the beginning of this century, we have seen uh, the adoption of certain policies also concerning the field of content uh, in relation, for example, to the exemption of liability of online intermediaries. Because, of course, it is, um, it is clear that public authorities have not the resources, you know, to enforce uh, some kind of, or, I don't know, to take all the aid speech. And so they need to rely on online intermediaries that have been called in so many different ways, like gatekeepers, uh, all platforms, intermediaries. Uh, and so this shows how these are really critical and necessary uh, piece of the puzzle, you know, in the field of uh, online enforcement. And so the question is how, and this is another question for the, the rule of law, uh, how um, states, uh, member states, or even the union uh, rely on social media for other, for um, for public purposes, you know, like, and the terrorist regulation is a clear example of how governments can use social media, for example, to restrict freedom of expression. And so these are questions that are not just how public authorities, for example, can use biometric technologies, for example, but the the very interesting question is where, where are the boundaries when public authorities collaborate with social media, you know, to policy content online or pursue any other public policies. And this is a big concern also at the end, the beginning of the, the century, uh, where scholars like uh, Michael Birnak and Ivan Kinkaran uh, called um, this, this effect like the invisible handshakes that sometimes characterize the relationship between states and the private sector, especially in the case of surveillance. And so what is important, especially for digital constitutionalism in Europe, is to unpack this collaboration and increase transparency and accountability in this case. Mm-hmm. It really does raise questions in the sense that, you know, if these public authorities depend on these private companies that are offering these technologies that you know provides them with even more po- provides them even more power how can we then really take a constitutional approach uh, all too seriously because these public authorities would never you know take the actions that perhaps would be necessary because they depend on these tech companies uh, to perform what they then again uh, need to to you know to keep their power but i think it's a very important discussion that uh, will gain more uh, interest and more importance over at least the coming uh, years anyway. Um, and what we've also seen in the private sector, um, which is an interesting development, I think, is more this focus on private regulation, like self-regulation of, for example, tech companies. But we've seen it before in other industries, uh, also related to tech. You can think of the robotic communities where there is standardizations or private regulations. Uh, and one example that we've seen with regard to tech companies is, for example, uh, the recent initiative by Facebook. Now, 
this is a quite, I guess, a controversial topic to talk about in a way. Um, what do you think of an initiative like this? Do you think that such private um, regulation uh, can be a step forward? So uh, this, is, this is another important piece of the puzzle because uh, the Facebook Oversight Board actually um, is a kind of piece of, uh, of an increasing path towards the institutionalization of uh, private ordering, you know, uh, because uh, there have been, you know, uh, debates, uh, blog posts, and even research articles dealing with uh, the nature of this board, you know. Um, it's not clear, of course, what is its nature, if it is just oversight, if it is reflects a Supreme Court, a Facebook Supreme Court, but it's just a matter of label in this case. What I think uh, is that the Facebook Oversight Board is a way also for, for Facebook, in this case, also to search for uh, uh, legitimation and show to be more transparent and accountable in the process of content moderation. This is a good thing, you know, uh, but at the same time, we should be aware uh, of the fact that the Facebook Oversight Board is actually an experiment. They, of course, do not deal with so many cases and, of course, sometimes lack sometimes the nuance that is necessary to moderate content on a global scale. And so the question is whether, and the, the real question is whether maybe the Facebook Oversight Board is in a way a kind of mandatory step for Facebook to increase uh, uh, its legitimacy and to present itself on a global scale as, uh, you know, as an actor that has, uh, of course, has arrived in this market, firstly, providing a kind of social media council, uh, not just that, but also providing a system of redress that uh, mirrors uh, actually what a judicial authority or a constitutional review, more or less, on a global scale. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, you could think that um, such a private initiative would be more efficient, perhaps, than what we see on a public level. Right. Uh, and that's why, for example, in some of the work that I am I'm doing at the moment, what I see is that such private regulation can be really, really effective. Um, but I think what we need, maybe, I don't know if you agree, but what we need is an, an incentive in these companies to actually operate uh, such private initiatives with transparency and with accountability for, for such an initiative to work. Because I truly do believe, despite all these, uh, you know, this controversy re- surrounding Facebook, that an initiative like the this for uh, social media companies or platform companies can be really effective. Uh, let's go back once, once again to the Facebook Oversight Board, because you said a very interesting thing that uh, the Facebook Oversight Board is also a way, you know, uh, to ensure, uh, in a way, also to overcome some deadlocks in the field of human rights. Also because they provide a more efficient framework, you know, for enforcing these human rights rather than relying, for example, on regional courts. And so the question is whether really um, this kind of uh, private initiatives, you know, are ways also to, uh, to, in a way, to fill that kind of bottom-up gap that we face in the last 20 years. Because uh, in the field of digital technologies, uh, we have increasingly seen uh, not only the rise of private ordering, of course, but also a lot of regulation, especially in the last years. And so the question is whether, you know, this kind of private ordering is, ordering is increasingly becoming constitutional, you know, providing more rules, accountability, and I mean internal rules and accountability safeguards, you know, or transparency safeguards. And so the question, uh, once again, is, uh, and that is good in a way, you know, because if in a, if uh, also private actors uh, can, uh, you know, uh, inject or adopt the kind of uh, safeguards that in a way uh, comes from uh, traditional constitutional values, this is a good thing. The problem is that we cannot really trust, of course, private actors totally, like we cannot trust governments, you know, uh, because, of course, they, of course, are not required to comply with constitutional safeguards because they are private actors. And in the lack of any regulation, they are they are they cannot be required to respect freedom of expression in their private spaces, you know. And so the question is, once again, how one and we go back there once again. Uh, how we can ensure that public actors provide that kind of constitutional framework in which the private sector can operate, you know. And this calls, again, um, the role of co-regulation in this case, where public actors can provide uh, the rules and the principles according to which then uh, the private sector, like social media, then, of course, implement their services. This does not mean just to provide top-down rules, but, uh, but... uh, and at the same time, it does not mean just to rely on self-regulation. I think we need to look more for 
for, for a kind of third way to address this problem. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I think that we see this back also in some of the recent initiatives that the EU, for example, has taken. Uh, we see it in, for example, the DSA, we see it with the AI Act, where the EU kind of provides a framework, right? Uh, can you maybe talk us through some of the these initiatives that the EU is taking uh, at the moment? I mean, we could fill a whole podcast episode with these <laughs> initiatives, but still. Yeah, y- y- you're, completely, you're completely right, because, uh, I mean, uh, even... Of course, the GDPR is not anymore, you know, recent in a way. Uh, and of course, now we we are, you know, we are discussing uh, a lot of the, the characteristics even of the DSA and also the Inter- Artificial Intelligence Act. But we should not forget, for example, that also the terror regulation, the regulation on terrorist content have been just adopted. And so the European Union is really, uh, has really provided the, uh, different initiatives, you know, and also measures to deal with digital capitalism, but in general with online content. But what is important is a kind of the method that the European Union is using to address this problem. And we can, we can see how there is not a kind of regulation of content, but this is more the regulation of the procedure according to which content are moderated or are addressed. And this is a big difference, you know, comparing also with other trends, not only in Europe, but especially in other continents like Africa, where there is an increasing criminalization, you know, of, of hate speech of the, and the online platforms and content moderation. So uh, it is quite important to understand how also the path of, once again, of the European digital constitution, so the reaction of European constitution law to the challenges of digital, pla- of digital capitalism has not just led, you know, a kind of reaction, an hard reaction, uh, uh, regulating content and saying, actually, what is this information or what is hate speech, you know, and the requiring platform to moderate according to legal definition. But what is more important in a democratic society, and this is the kind of the characterization, really, of European digital constitution, is, is actually to leave, of course, you know, as we said, platform free, you know, to take decisions, but to be more transparent and accountable for these decisions. So you can, you can, the, the principle is that you, you can be free, you know, to moderate this information, but they want to know more on how you do that, you know, on how many removals you run every year, uh, who are your trusted flaggers and why it's so relevant, you know, when you uh, take decision, for example, on a public authority. And you know, here we can talk about even the deplatforming of the President Trump that actually raised this point, because this shows also in a transatlantic perspective also how uh, the issue of content moderation is, uh, is addressed in two different ways. Uh, not, of course, that are opposite ways, uh, but the reason why also we, we look at so uh, this t- kind of transatlantic gap, you know, it's just because also of, constitution, of different constitutional premises around content moderation. And I mean, because uh, when we look at Europe, the, 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 the debate about content moderation is around not only about freedom of expression, but it's also about the freedom to conduct business of online platform. And these are kind of two freedoms that can sometimes clash each, other, clash each other, you know, and they're different from the First Amendment, from the First Amendment basis, constitutional basis in the US. And of course, Shield platform as business actors, but also, you know, but also uh, as engine of democracy at the same time, you know. And so this is a very different point because uh, this affects also the balancing between fundamental rights in Europe. But of course, it's a different understanding of this process. Uh, and this, of course, leads us to, to understand uh, why in, in the U.S. also some uh, platform uh, actually have more freedoms, you know, to moderate content. While, for example, not just looking at the EU, but looking at member states, for example, in Italy and in Germany, we have seen how courts, for example, have recognized, uh, have recognized and required, for example, Facebook to reinstate content that have been removed, content from right-wing political party that have been removed, you know, because that kind of removal, discretionary removal, clash with constitutional safeguards, you know. And in that case, we had a kind of horizontal translation translation of constitutional rights into private relationship. But this is because, once again, of the characteristics of the European constitution is that are more open towards horizontality, you know, in constitutional rights rather than the vertical relationship between public authority and in the in the private sector, you know, and so this will explain us why we are looking at two different approaches across the Atlantic to the very same problem of content moderation in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Um, now, looking towards the future, I think that's also maybe a nice point to uh, to wrap up the episode a bit. Um, you mentioned that you see us heading towards a fourth phase uh, following the digital constitutionalism or phase three that we are in right now. Can you maybe talk us through what, how do you see this phase or what do you envision? Uh, I think that we can see, because, you know, we, we have talked about the rise of the European digital constitution. And so I think that the fourth phase maybe will be characterized by the consolidation of this approach. And I think that the DSA, the Digital Services Act, is a very good example, you know, of the path the European Union has followed in the last 20 years. And, uh, but I think that we need to understand more, you know, uh, where the European Union will actually, uh, will, uh, will uh, how the European Union will address these challenges and how we'll characterize the new phase of digital constitutions. What I think is that there are kind of um, um, uh, trade-offs or maybe regulatory dilemmas, you know, that the European Union will face. And of course, this will lead the European, the European digital constitutionalism once again to uh, find its place, you know. And I'm referring in particular, for example, you know, we address a lot about the issue of digital humanism uh, compared, of course, to digital capitalism. And this is quite interesting because uh, there have been so many calls, you know, for, especially in the case of AI, for the role of humans. But if we look at the uh, uh, the AI regulation, so the AI, the, the Artificial Intelligence Act, we cannot see really this human-centric approach. We can see more a top-down approach from the, Euro Com the European Commission that in a way looks more at uh, regulating the internal market uh, um, rather than putting a human or users, basically, at the center, like the GDPR, the DSA, in a way. And this is also shown by the lack of remedies for, you know, users or citizens to address uh, the lack, the failure to comply, you know, of operators uh, dealing with AI technologies, you know. Um, and this is one of the first, and I think that the European, of course, uh, will find its way between this approach, between digital humanism and digital capitalism. And also, I think that the DSA, the GDPR, and even the, or the Artificial Intelligence Act show this trend also because the artificial intelligence act opens its recitals also with the with the reference to the european values so democracy the rule of law and so this is something that is really different from from the past uh, and but there are still the other dilemmas uh, like uh, between uh, and we have already discussed that between uh, public authorities and private ordering because we increasingly see uh, platforms of course setting standards becoming a social infrastructure you know like we have seen uh, during the pandemic, and of course, they propose increasingly um, standards that, of course, also uh, public actors are interested in a way are charmed by these standards. Uh, we can use the example of smart cities uh, to, for example, uh, to underline how public actors and private actors increasingly collaborate to achieve common goals, you know. Uh, and so the point is that here, once again, co-regulation, uh, once again, uh, would be the, the approach of the union uh, probably in the next years to to find a way, but not just in the next years. The approach of co-regulation has characterized already the approach of the union in the, in, uh, in the last 10 years. And I think that would, this is what actually characterized the European approach rather than just, uh, you know, uh, going towards digital authoritarianism and public authority or just neoliberal approach and self-regulation in a way, you know. But I think there is even a last trend about, and it's another area of debate about, extraterritoriality of European constitutional values, because we have seen also in the Schrems case, but also in other decisions of the European Court of Justice very recent, like Google CNIL, how the extraterritoriality of constitutional values has been better defined, is also limited in some cases, uh, also in respect to the freedom of member states to take decision on this point. Uh, and it's also important to understand how this extraterritorial framework of European constitutional values Will will uh, will um, will expand also because being uh, you know opening of course the door towards constitutional values means also you know to be influenced by other poles or poles of powers, uh, power poles and and this maybe could lead also the European framework to actually close more its boundaries you know and regulate its market to avoid the external interferences in a way the the artificial intelligence act is an example of this form of uh, what, I, what I try to call constitutional protectionism, you know. Uh, but the, even in this case, I, I do not think that the European Union is trying to extend actually 
uh, too much its constitutional values on a global scale, even if we can think about the Brussels effect, and this is really true, quoting, of course, uh, Anne of Bradford. Um, but I think that the European Union is trying to find once again a third way, you know, between between ensuring uh, to ensure that you know formalities, you know, or even establishment of the territorial establishment do not are not just used as justification or excuse not to not to comply or ensure the protection of fundamental rights in the Union, you know, and the GDPR is an example of that for sure. Yeah, no, definitely. I think these are all valid points, and I very much liked your. Uh remark on basically that the future should be collaborative in a way, co-regulation. Uh... Yes, absolutely. But uh, in, the, in the last footnote, this does not mean, this is important to stress, because this does not mean to go back to a neoliberal approach where actually you rely just on the private sector to enforce public policies. Because actually the lessons of digital constitutionalism, the rise of digital constitutionalism has been a reaction to this problem. So the co-regulatory framework here is increasingly um, show a more role, the, an increasing role of the public sector of the of the of the European Union and also member states to provide the, the, those constitutional safeguards that are necessary in order to ensure that private actors do not abuse their freedoms, you know, but actually perform their activities and also are engines of democracies, but respecting the constitutional values that are still agreed debated in democratic circuits, of course. I think that is a very important footnote to make. Uh, and thank you very much for your insights. I think it's uh, really, really valuable. So yeah, for now, Giovanni, it was great having you on the show. Uh, maybe we can do like a follow-up in the future uh, after we've uh, seen what the DSA or the impact of the DSA is and the AI regulation. Uh, it could be interesting to see what's going on once we actually uh, get a little further into the fourth phase. For sure. Thanks to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Law of Tech podcast. If you want to make sure you keep up to date with the show and never miss out on an episode, be sure to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice and follow the Law of Tech on social media. If you enjoyed the show, please give it a rating or review as it helps others discover the show. And don't forget to share it with your network. For now, have a great day and I'll see you in the next episode of the Law of Tech podcast.